Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, Editor of Foreign Affairs, and welcome to another segment of Foreign Affairs Focus. This time we have a great chance of talking with Zalmay Khalilzad, uh, one of America's leading experts on Afghanistan, former ambassador to Afghanistan and Iraq, former U.S. UN ambassador, uh, and all-around good guy. Zal, welcome. And uh, so what is going to happen now after a decade of American involvement uh, in Afghanistan? Well, there is some uncertainty uh, facing Afghanistan and our uh, strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis it. Um, on the one hand, there is a, some prospects limited at this point of a negotiated settlement for the first time, possibly. Uh, the uh, Afghans and the Pakistanis have come to an agreement uh, about a proposed approach uh, to negotiations with the Taliban. And the Afghan president made a statement after his visit, uh, which was uh, also supported by the United States, about uh, meetings with the Taliban. Then the Pakistanis came uh, in support of that uh, statement. Now, peacemaking is as difficult as, as, as war, uh, perhaps in some ways even more so. So uh, uh, one has to be uh, cautious about, uh, you know, the peace is about to break out. Uh, but I think that is, that is one um, uh, option, uh, one possibility for Afghanistan. Another is that uh, with the uh, uh, domestic changes and pressures here, that if we don't get a negotiated settlement in time or in, in, the, in the near future, that America uh, might look at options uh, of cutting back or even abandoning Afghanistan. That would have its own uh, implications, which would mean another uh, big civil war like the 1990s with the, when, the, when the Soviets left uh, Afghanistan. Well, let's press that for a second. So let's mm -hmm. take your ordinary American who doesn't care that much about Afghanistan for its own sake. Uh, started paying attention after 9-11, right. uh, now says, gee, we've been there for 10 years, bin Laden is dead and al-Qaeda is on the run, uh, we've made a good faith effort, uh, why are we still spending a lot of blood and treasure, why don't we just come home in a relatively uh, deliberate pace, uh, who cares if Afghanistan goes bad? I think the trend is in that direction, uh, uh, public opinion uh, polls indicate that. Uh, but the uh, American administration still uh, uh, would like to see a, a, one, a negotiated settlement possibly, if not, uh, the strengthening of Afghan forces uh, so that they can uh, do more of the, uh, the fighting for the uh, uh, future and that there would be a residual U.S. presence uh, w uh, in, in the context of a strategic partnership with the Afghan government. Uh, to, over time, uh, either lead to a negotiated settlement, if not now, later, or to a victory uh, uh, or success or in a better circumstance for the Afghan government. The reason for that, the logic of it, uh, which I support, is that uh, uh, the, the fear is that if we uh, abandon Afghanistan altogether, uh, we may have to go back again at some point down the road because uh, you could get a replay more or less of the 1990s. There will be a civil war. The neighbors will come uh, supporting different groups. And then Al-Qaeda or other extremists could come back again. So if we can, uh, with some confidence, have a situation where we don't have to go back again or keep bombing Afghanistan for uh, uh, every time there is, a, there is a trouble, uh, and that, uh, that would be a much better thing. But also there's a reputational dimension of it that after investing so much, uh, America's prestige is involved. The regional stability issues are important. Remember that it's India and Pakistan, they are involved in Afghanistan. We don't want the rivalry there to escalate into a conflict between the two uh, nuclear powers. So if we can have a reasonably uh, um, s uh, successful strategy of kind of lowering the cost, but yet uh, getting to a, um, Afghanistan to a better place, uh, it's, worth, uh, it's worth trying. Let's talk about the Quran burning issue for a second. How could such a thing happen in the first place? And second, uh, what's your take on the whole reaction to it? Well, of uh, uh, course, we don't know exactly what has happened. There's an investigation going on, and based on my experience uh, dealing with these issues, the first reports are generally incorrect, uh, the fog of war kind of thing. 
but uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you know, so, uh, the, the likely uh, situation was that uh, without thinking or not knowing uh, by some uh, mistake, uh, this this uh, Quran, the number of them were being burned. I'm a little surprised personally by that after being there for 10 years that there is, uh, you know, we've got all kinds of cultural advisors with the troops, a lot of them Afghans or Afghan Americans that uh, there hasn't been kind of uh, uh, cultural training or acc acculturation uh, briefings uh, for the troops as to, you know, the do's and don'ts, and there are a few don'ts that you in particular want to make sure one doesn't do. But I think that the, the reaction of the Afghans, uh, 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 it's been a little uh, surprising uh, um, uh, that uh, shows that there is the level of dissatisfaction is, is, is among the population. Um, uh, there is dissatisfaction here about what's going on after 10 years. There is also dissatisfaction there. We're not as popular as we used to be. People are tired of the war that's been going on for a very long time. Uh, there is also, I'm sure, uh, they, uh, those who don't want uh, to, to us to succeed or don't wish us well see these things as opportunities to, 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 to uh, uh, increase anti-Americanism and to take advantage of it. And uh, there are not only internal forces, some uh, extremist forces that are part of the Afghan political context, but also some of the neighbors uh, would like us to, 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 to fail uh, or at least remain entangled there for them to take advantage of it. Uh, so uh, I, I would think we, uh, this uh, leads one to analyze what's going on uh, to, uh, in Afghanistan in terms of the attitudes of the Afghan people towards us. I don't know how widespread that was because in some parts of Afghanistan where you normally would get a lot of reaction, like Kandahar, the birthplace of the Taliban, it, uh, nothing really happened. Or Mazar in the north where uh, there was a, an awful attack on the UN a couple of years ago, nothing happened. And, but in some other places, it, 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 there was a very sustained uh, reaction. Did it have to do really with the broad anti-Americanism among the Afghans or was that specific circumstances or particular leaders, uh, local leaders, uh, that, uh, that may have had something to do with it? Some candidates have criticized the administration for Obama's apology. Was that a mistake? Well, I don't know uh, what they apologized for because we didn't yet know exactly what had happened. But I know is, uh, the reason he did it was uh, because on the advice of, of people on the ground that in order to calm things down, that maybe an apology uh, uh, w would be useful by the president. And I know from uh, President Karzai, whom I saw the day before yesterday uh, in Kabul after he had uh, received that uh, letter and uh, apology, he, he was very appreciative of it. Uh, and I'm sure that, that came on the advice of, of, of people in the field. But uh, of course, normally one would like to know what exactly happened uh, before you say, well, I'm sorry for what happened, uh, so to speak. And we really don't know. I mean, there is an investigation going on. Uh, but I can, see, uh, I can see what led him uh, to, to do what he had to do because he wanted to, ha to, have a, uh, to calm down the situation. One last question. Uh, you were also ambassador to Iraq, of course. Uh, now that our forces are out, <clears throat> What's your, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of Iraq? Well, I think uh, I am uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, uh, of course, we were a kind of cushion between the various communities. They still have issues to work out among themselves uh, uh, in terms of uh, power sharing uh, and in terms of what kind of Iraq they would like to see happen. Uh, that uh, that would, without that cushion, which uh, uh, I think uh, it would have been better if we could have stayed there in some form until the next Iraqi election, because they, they're moving towards an election again. But uh, uh, the institutions have been holding. Uh, I, I think we need to uh, rely on other instruments uh, to encourage uh, cooperation among the communities and kind of uh, resolving their differences uh, peacefully. I would have liked uh, uh, Prime Minister Maliki, for example, to pardon uh, the, the Vice President Tarek Hashimi for whatever he had done or not done uh, in the name of, uh, of, uh, of national unity, or to agree to a, a trial that is, could be credible, uh, uh, because uh, Tarek Hashimi did a lot for Iraq. Uh, you know, uh, when he was the first Sunni leader that joined the political process, I had uh, worked very hard to bring him 
on board and his brother and his uh, sister and a bunch of his family members were massacred by the Al-Qaeda in Iraq at that time uh, as to how he had to kind of uh, abandoned the community as they saw it. Uh, as, uh, but uh, but I, I think the performance of the institutions encouraged me that uh, maybe they will be able to hold. But uh, Iraq is also under pressure because of regional developments, uh, sort of Shia Sunni tensions across the region uh, has, uh, has increased uh, in recent times. And Iraq is the fulcrum of that, uh, the two world of Shia Islam and Sunni Islam coming in contact with each other. and. Uh, also, Syria uh, is, is, is critical for how it, uh, it will uh, shape Iraq. So there is a lot of nervousness there. But I remain still cautiously optimistic that they will work it out. From your lips to God's ears. Uh, thank with you. With that, thank you very much. Thank Sal you. Thank you.